Welcome to Marketing Matters, I'm Peter Applebaum. This episode explores a very common question. Is e-commerce right for your business? Last year, Australians spent over $32 billion via online shopping, an increase of 21% since 2013. We love the convenience, the choice, and of course the immediacy of buying online. But what does this mean for you? If anything, let's say you're a real estate agent, or you run a beauty salon, or you're a builder. That's what we're going to discuss with the co-founder and director of one of Australia's largest e-commerce businesses. As always, we'll also ask our expert panel for their opinions on this potentially exciting opportunity for your business. We're going to speak to Susan Workner from Interactive Investor, Kelvin Kirk from Pure Profile, and Jennifer Jones from offline and online homewares retailer, The Vignette Room. But first, our one-on-one -on -one discussion of the week. E-commerce site Booktopia started as a side project selling books in 2004. Today, it turns over more than $100 million a year with no external investment and has served over 3.8 million Australians. Booktopia is one of Australia's success stories. We now employ over 150 people, readers like you, lovers of books. Booktopia now stocks up to 130,000 titles. When you add it all up, that's nearly a million books in our warehouse. A million books. All ready to ship out to eager readers around Australia. Something we love to do here at Booktopia is give people who don't have access to their favourite authors the opportunity to buy a signed copy. A signed copy from your favourite author is something special. We love books. Whether it be the book team that talk to the publishers and talk to the authors, to the warehouse staff who pick it and pack it and get it out as fast as possible to you, or our customer service team who are always here to help. Here to tell us all about it and to help to identify ways forward with e-commerce for other businesses like yours is Steve Traurig, co-founder and director of Booktopia. Welcome, Steve. Hi. So, could you tell us what made you start an online bookstore? Well, my two brother-in-laws and I were already an internet marketing consulting business. Right. We were helping small businesses do well on the internet. Mm -hmm. And we came upon an opportunity to actually create an online bookstore, but off the back of another company that was doing all the logistics and fulfilment and the website. Now, we were already working full-time in our consultancy, and so my brother-in-law, Simon, who managed our finances, said, if you're going to do something like this, you have to do it outside of hours, right. and you can have a budget of $10 a day. And Tony... That's, that's via Google? Yep, that's exactly right. Well, that, actually, that was our total marketing spend, right. and that was it. Yep. And so um, we actually got the bookstore set up, set up a Google AdWords, and on the third day, we sold our first book. And from then on, it just snowballed and snowballed. A lot of celebrations on that third day, no doubt. Yeah, there certainly was. Do you remember That's what the right. book was? I don't. No, I don't. Oh, well. So from that point of view, you sold your first book in the, in the third day. Was the business successful from the start, from thereafter? Or were there other doubts about the, the viability? Were there bumps along the road? From our point of view, it was successful because, number one, we had low expectations, but number two, we were only investing back in what we could afford. And I think that's really important when you're starting up any business, mm -hmm. um, is to make sure that you are in control of your numbers. Right. And so as we were building the business, selling more and more books, then we were investing more and more into the company and not overstretching. Okay, which is obviously a prudent business practice. And that's, that's right. That's something we're going to be talking about a lot on this particular episode. Mm -hmm. And how have your e-commerce strategies evolved over the 14 years to continue your success and growth? That's a great question and in fact it's been a real ride because starting off from uh, a few guys in an office in North Sydney to now uh, 12,000 square metres in Lidcombe, you know, it's been quite a journey. And so we've, met, we've had to look at so many things on our website but also off our website as well. So as you start selling more and more, you have to deliver. Right. You have to provide customer service. You have to have the right technology in place as more and more visitors come to your website. And we've had to evolve all the areas of our business in that way to actually keep up with the demand and, in fact, drive it. OK. And you've mentioned before that your central focus is what do our customers want. Absolutely. Can you tell us more about that mantra and how it impacts on the e-commerce aspect of Booktopia? Absolutely. 
what your customers want is probably the most important mantra that we use in our business. Why? Because it actually drives everything that you do um, from the website right through to delivery, through to post-sale uh, post customer service. So if you keep on asking yourselves what do you what do customers what does your customer want, you actually do things like move several suburbs away and build a distribution centre that's really close to Australia Post so you can get more parcels out the same day. Okay. You build a call centre so that you can actually talk to customers. Um, you build more technology in your website so that customers can buy more product. Right. And let's finish up by talking about the $230 billion elephant in the room. Is the launch of Amazon in Australia a threat for Booktopia or do you, do you see it as an opportunity? Amazon's obviously a really massive company and mm. $230 billion is a is a big number. That's Australian dollars. Yeah, that's exactly right. We see it as an opportunity and there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, with Amazon coming into any marketplace, they actually drive more people online. That's good for us. The other part of it is that it makes people far more um, wanting to perhaps look at an Australian alternative of which we are. And the third part of it is that we actually sell on the Amazon marketplace. Oh, there you go. And so it's, it's actually an opportunity for us as we do on other marketplaces there. there. Steve, I'd like to thank you for your time and for, and for giving us such interesting and fascinating insights into, into really what is an incredible growth area for a lot of, uh, of organisations and a, lot of, a bigger opportunity area. There are a lot of lessons there that many of us can use when considering an e-commerce play. After the break, we speak to three experts on the marketing panel. Welcome back. Tonight we're discussing whether e-commerce is right for your business. And we're joined by Susan Workner, Managing Director of Interactive Investor, Kelvin Kirk, Managing Director of Market Research Company Pure Profile, and Jennifer Jones, Co-Founder of The Vignette Room. Susan, what are the advantages of an e-commerce business over a storefront? Well, I think the most significant um, advantage is that it is now a level playing field for small business. Um, the internet allows that. So it's a big win for small business. I think some of the huge advantages of e-commerce are, number one, I think the cost advantage because you can obviously automate all of your processes. You don't need to hold inventory like Booktopia, we heard earlier, has to have manufacturing, etc. Or not manufacturing, but at least a warehousing. Uh, we also have globally you're able to communicate to customers around 24-7. So that's very important. Mm -hmm. Niche marketing is another advantage as opposed to physical businesses because with niche marketing and e-commerce, Google and SEO can help you be, to be found by customers from around the world. Yep. So a lot of great advantages. Okay. And you're on 24 by 7. 24 by 7, yep, we <laughs> never sleep. So to that point, Kelvin, as you never sleep, <laughs> how does a business transition from 100% offline to an e-commerce play? Well, there's a few things. I think uh, test, learn, leverage, have a look what everybody else is doing. You can create a website for $10. You can leverage tools that are available like Shopify to actually take e-commerce transactions without actually going 100% online. You can still test some of the, the benefits of online while still having that bricks and mortar. And there's so many free tools and there's so many ways you can learn like uh, Linda, which is a service that LinkedIn provides, allows you to actually learn. You can watch videos about how to build a commerce site. You learn that for free. But I guess obviously there's much more involved in just building the site and we talk about that a bit later on. Yeah, you've got to drive the traffic. You've also got to be relevant. Of course, yeah. of course. And Jennifer, what are the most important aspects of a successful e-commerce site? You obviously have a, a wonderful homeware store in Paddington. What have you found are the most important ways of driving traffic online and getting sales? Yeah, so I think having a really well-designed website, you know, it needs to be um, you know, easy to navigate for people who are using it. Um, it, it needs to um, you know, really show your products in the best light. Um, you know, for someone like us, it's, it's really about that visual um, you know, thing. So having really beautiful imagery, um, having you know, accurate sizing and, and product descriptions and things like that. Um, also giving people you know, inspiration on 
on how they could use the products um, in their own homes and things like that um, is really useful for us. Um, so yeah, I think it needs to be sort of easy to navigate, um, you know, seamless kind of process in your checkout system as well. Are uh, you looking to drive more online sales through your e-commerce engine? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's definitely always something we want to keep on building. Um, you know, they sort of work um, hand in hand with each other, the storefront and, and the e-commerce site. But right. yeah, definitely something we want to keep building on. Excellent. And Susan, if I'm looking to start a business today, should I start an e-commerce business or a physical business? Well, I think, I think that very much depends on what you're trying to sell. You know, products and services, some work really well, just as e-commerce businesses, some actually need both. Probably like furniture, for example, interior design, people want to touch and feel certain right. things. So if that's the case, then I think you, it's best to have both a bricks and mortar business as well as e-commerce. Some things where you don't need to feel and touch, and you don't need to try them on, you can have just an e-commerce business. So it depends on the type of business you're talking about, Kelly. Yeah, well, and also, actually both of them complement each other. Yeah. A lot of people search and then buy in bricks and mortar and vice versa, they'll go and look at the bricks and mortar and then actually see if they can get a better price online. Didn't one of the, the senior executives of one retailer say that he's sick of being the, the, the changing room for Amazon? Well, exactly, yep. exactly. So the people, over 50% of people will search online, but often the transaction will occur in the bricks and mortar. The key is to try and once they're in there, capture them and actually get that transaction. And that might have been a challenge for that guy. Of course. Now, Jennifer, as you are paying, obviously, for your bricks and mortar store, yep. and you've got, you mentioned, I think, before 15% of your sales are via e-commerce. Yep. I mean, how can a business grow that proportion of your sales? Yep. Um, you know, I think it's just really about um, keeping your, your products sort of, you know, relevant on there, um, keeping them up to date, um, you know, responding to feedback from your customers as well. Um, you know, we get a lot of feedback from our customers saying that, that you you know, they find certain things might be missing, um, so really responding to what our customers are saying. Okay, so do you, I know you're very active on social media, yep. what are some other ways that uh, you drive people both to your store and also to your e-commerce Yeah, site? so social's a massive, massive, right. um, you know, driver for our business. Um, as I said before, it's such a visual um, industry, so, you know, being able to show people um, what our products can do, um, you know, how we set them up in store, giving them inspiration on how they can use them in their own homes it is hugely powerful for us in, in being able to push our product, um, you know, but even these days, everything, every bit of advertising we do, even if it's print or it's digital, everything links back to our website, um, you know, and it shows people who we are, what we're about in a really, you know, quick way, um, and they can qualify if then they want to come to the store. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. And Susan, I know you've built several e-commerce sites for your clients. Um, what percentage of a business do you think should be online? What uh, versus the, the uh, I guess, their traditional way of doing business? Well, again, I think that depends on what type of business you have. I think look, you can look at the big ones like Amazon, you know, one of the powerhouses that's been an e-commerce business all this time for, what, 23, 24 years. They've literally opened a bricks and mortar store just recently in Seattle. Mm. So I think there's no rule. I think, I think the internet has really changed all business rules you might have thought about 25 years ago. So I think it's really where is the customer? Where will you bring greater growth, greater profitability to your business? So therefore, I don't think there's a cut and dried percentage that will work for any particular business. And actually an interesting stat about mm -hmm. Walmart uh, and Amazon, Walmart's 10 times as large as Amazon in terms of turnover. Oh, really? Wow. But Amazon is the largest e-commerce site in the world. That's right. But e-commerce represents about 10% of total transactions in terms of retail. So, From an Australian yes. point of view, you, you obviously do an <coughs> omnibus research yep. on a weekly basis. Yep. Do you find that consumers, Australian consumers, are more inclined or getting more inclined over a period of time to shop online? Uh, they, I refer back to before, they do a lot of research, and, but interesting enough, the offline, other channels, about 50% of the decisions are made with offline engagement, like print or outdoor or word of mouth, and the other 50% that d makes a person decide on what product they want is online, so it's actually evenly weighted. Right. And Jennifer, with uh, having that e-commerce aspect to your business, has it impacted on your customer loyalty in a negative or a positive sense? Um, I think a positive sense, um, you know, we really try to um, treat every customer that comes to our e-commerce site as we would someone who's standing right in front of us. You know, it's really about creating an experience for people online as well, you know, a, a personal experience as well. Um, so, you know, for us, it, it's about thank you notes that are, you know, handwritten, handwritten, handwritten yeah. inside, you know, every, every order that we send out, um, you know, having really flexible return um, policies for our clients. They have that, um, you know, faith or the trust in us that they can order 
disorder and if something isn't right, um, you know, it, it's an easy process for them to sort of come back to us um, with that. And, you know, again, it's just a value add thing for us. You know, we're always willing to sort of give our, um, you know, our help in, in helping them if they've got questions about how they could use a cushion or, a, or whatever it is in their own homes. So it's not about the platform or the technology, it's about the relationships. Absolutely. Wonderful. So coming up after the break, we hear from some viewers and the panel will discuss some of their questions. And welcome back to Marketing Matters. In this segment, we're going to answer your questions about e-commerce. And right to our first caller, Elliot Kleiner. Hi, Elliot. Hi, Pete. How are you? Very well, thank you. And what's your business? My company is Prom Night Events. We're one of our management firm for high school formals. Now, we've been into the uh, uh, e-commerce thing for quite a few years, and it goes really well for us. We use a, a popular online ticketing platform called TriBooking. Uh, the problem that we face, the only snag we face, and I'm, I'm really interested to see if your learned panel can come up with an idea for me, mm. is that uh, with these sorts of events, everybody knows that they're on when and where, but what they tend to do is leave booking of their tickets until the last minute. What we really would like to see is people booking as quickly as possible or as early as possible so that we can even out the revenue streams throughout uh, the course of the month leading up to an event. So I'm, I'm interested in any ideas anybody has about how we can drive some traffic to uh, with some some kind of incentive to get people to buy their tickets as early as possible. So, Susan, what do you think? Briefly? Uh, I think a sold-out rocket. I think what? that's what he needs. A sold-out <laughs> rocket. There you go, Elliot. That's sold exactly what you need. A sold-out <laughs> rocket. Need. I think what happens is early on, people always think tickets are going to last forever. So if you can manage to have some very early on pre-sales tickets that are that are um, premium level, you only have a very few of them, even if you only have five of those special VIP tickets, and you can write on that booking form that there's a section of your tickets that are already sold out, that will motivate people to, to purchase early because they think it's going to be sold out till the end. Can we put some value in for buying early? So you may, you know, pricing structure could be, you know, it is $100, but if you buy now, a week out, it's $80. Or put something in terms of premium drinks or something that uh, is added value. Added value. Yeah. And then maybe have a countdown clock or, a, countdown you know, clock. or the you know, number of tickets left, yep. etc. Yep. Jennifer, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's about you kind of creating that urgency for people. You know, I need to buy now because I'll, I'll get this, you Wonderful. know, or, you know. So, you know, it could be partnering with like-minded businesses as well to sort of, you know, can they offer a, you know, percentage discount right. voucher or something like that, you know, for the first 50 people who buy tickets, yep. you know, you get a voucher for 10%. Yeah, exactly. yeah, so, you know, something okay. like that too. Yep. Okay, sponsors. Elliot. Sponsors can actually That's true. help market to you, yep. I think. Yep. Elliot, thank you very much for your call. And now to our next caller, Jeff Brooks. Jeff, what's your business? Uh, I'm a partner and business owner of HBA Legal, the good old fashioned legal services provider. Right, and what's your marketing query with regards to e commerce? Well, professional services don't necessarily niche well with e commerce, so how can we? better fit our provisional, uh, provide provision of professional services to e-commerce when we don't sell a physical product. Mm. I'm actually going to go to Jennifer because you do sell a physical product. I mean, yep. what are your thoughts about someone like Jeff who sells a professional service, which is an intangible? Yeah, um, I think, you know, it's going to really be about creating those relationships again. So being a really personable brand, um, you know, how do you communicate why, um, you know, your clients should go to you over, you know, the competition? Um, you know, is it about putting staff profiles on there so that people know who they're dealing with right. when they're speaking to s right. specific people? Okay. Um, I think really creating that persona around your brand and making people feel like it's a friend. Okay. Susan? I think uh, in terms of selling legal services, I actually think it's a perfect niche to have templates that you could sell. A lot of people don't know how to fill in different forms. Like, for example, there's a, there's a company in Australia called Legal Vision. They have templates you can purchase for, for websites if you want to have terms and conditions for your website. So there are actually opportunities, I think, very much for legal services to be online and have an e-commerce uh, play. 
Kelvin, I mean, <laughs> I mean you, sell, you sell an intangible service. I mean, what, what well, do you think? Yeah, and, and we get leads through our, our site. So people fill in forms and ask us to come back to them on, on queries to help their business and to gain insights into their, their customer set. But I think content can drive the engagement. There's no reason why you can't have a booking service. Mm. You can have a how-to, the top 10 tips. All of that content will drive engagement with the consumer, and then you need some call to action. So, well, how about you come and meet with us? Yeah. Jeff, I mean, do you do much? Have you got plans to increase your e-commerce capabilities? We certainly do a lot of work uh, in growing our business and trying to find different ways of doing business as a, a young law firm. Uh, but yeah, look, uh, we recognise the value, but tapping into that, that, that value and that market is a challenge. So I guess we're talking here, the, the panel I think has pretty much summed it up by saying we're talking about content, we're talking about I guess trying to create something that, that uh, your customers and potential customers can interact with and can purchase on a, on a regular basis. Would that be, does that resonate with you? Oh yes, but at the end of the day many professional services are relationship based so the challenge is to build that relationship and sustain it on, a, on a, an internet or an e-commerce platform rather than face to face. Well that's right. That's well, right. that's where something like podcasting and Skype can be very useful. Yeah, because we've actually seen a, a, a lawyer called Amanda Farmer who's in the Strata space, that's right. Strata Law space, who has a podcast and does sell services online. Hmm. That's right. OK, I'd like to thank Elliot and Jeff for calling in, and I'd also like to thank Susan, Kelvin and Jennifer for their time and insights on this week's panel. And let's go to the tips for this week. First, when it comes to is e-commerce right for your business, be up with the latest trends. Get a clear understanding of what's happening in the overall market and what your customers want. Second, be competitive. You'll need to answer this very simple question. Why should customers choose you? Sounds obvious, but it's critical. Third, understand the technology. Don't fall in love with the latest and greatest tech gadgets. Keep it simple and keep it relevant to your customers. Next. It's a business, people. E-commerce is just part of what you need to do. You also need to be on top of the boring things like systems and processes, cash flow and staffing issues. And finally, market like crazy. Be active like Jennifer is on social media, have on popular blog sites and also in traditional media. You can't set and forget e-commerce. And that's all for now. Don't forget that we'd love to hear from you. Give us your comments and suggestions and questions on Facebook at Marketing Matters TV or via the website at marketingmatterstv.com. Thanks for watching Marketing Matters and we look forward to seeing you next week.